<laughs> God bless the Reverend Ken. I thank you for that one. That, you might have you might have put him too too high that time. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I pray okay. we're, gonna be, we're gonna be praying for your grandson tonight in the game. I know it's the first game of the year, right? Yes. Yeah, it's first, yeah, game, yeah. first home game. First home game. That's right. That's why I forgot they played last week. We'll be praying that he does okay. wonderfully well tonight. Right. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Good evening. You. Good evening, everyone that's on the Zoom line and the phone line. It's good to be on here tonight again as we continue in our walk in the word of God. Uh, I've been thinking about this verse in chapter 22 and these verses in chapter 22 um, because I wanted to make sure that we were clear in regards to what was taking place in chapter in the chapter 21 and the early part of chapter 22. In chapter 21, in the end of chapter 21, the early part of chapter 22, what we see is, is Paul... Um, presenting before the people who sought to imprison important to remember because as he was presenting um he was presenting to a hostile crowd if you remember paul asked them to you know not necessarily be quiet but he wanted them to hear. and so they paused long enough to hear him he gave his testimony regarding his behavior prior to the damascus road and he gave them his a testimony of his behavior after the damascus road he gave them a testimony of how he had um had sought after Christians and, and persecuted Christians. And he also gave them uh, a testimony of what God did and how he God transformed him. And so in chapter 22, um, beginning at verse 17, he is still telling that story. He said, When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying to the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here would not accept your testimony about me. So now he is testifying what God had told him previously when he was in Jerusalem and how, if you remember correctly, he left Jerusalem the last time uh, because the people there was some was still hostile to him because they felt that he had, had, had a change. And, and that's what happens sometimes in your life as a child of God. You can, you can, you can live in the world, live in the world, live in the world, but you try to turn back uh, when you turn to Christ. Sometimes you may have a problem with it and may react hostilely to your, your, your new behavior. But Paul didn't let this stop him. Even Paul even wasn't because he was afraid. Paul left under the direction of God uh, to leave Jerusalem um, because his testimony wouldn't be accepted. In other words, God knew that the people in Jerusalem weren't ready for the testimony that Paul had, had so he moved Paul to another place. In verse uh, 19, Lord, Paul replied, Lord, I, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to a prison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyrs even was shed, I stood there giving my approval and God the clothes of those who were killing him. So that's what Paul's response was to God saying, leave. But then Paul now testifies in verse 21 that the Lord said to him, go and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. It appears that somewhere in there, that was a trigger that caused the people of Jerusalem to go crazy. Because if you look at the next verse, verse 22, the Bible says that the crowd had listened to Paul up until he said this. And this one, when they raised their voice and shouted, read the earth of him, he is not to live. Uh, it is clear that in Paul's testimony, that was true. That, that it was true. But it also appears that Paul, um, um, Paul's declaration in regards to God telling him to leave um, and, and, and his ministry was to the Gentiles was offensive to them. And so they wanted to have Paul killed. They said, literally, Paul is not to live. In verse 22, he says, and as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. So let me see if I can give you a picture of this. Uh, throwing dust in the air then was um, was, was an example or exemplary, exemplary of somebody saying they've had enough. You know, like you might, you, you might say it hurt when you were a child, somebody picking up dust or raising dust, raising sand. That's where that term came from, raising sand was what I heard but somebody would just throw sand in the air because they were just cutting up. And so these people want to know, Paul to know, and the Roman soldiers to know just how disgusted they were with Paul. And so they threw up, so imagine they throwing up their coats and, and flinging dust in the air. And the commander saw, he's not so much taking a time, but he realized somebody on Zoom has your phone unmuted. If you would mute it for me, please. Thank you so kindly. And so here, um, Paul then said, in this particular, uh, they, 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 the commander ordered that Paul be taken to the barracks, so Paul was taken to jail. And, and again, I think the initial movement of the, the commander was just to get Paul out of the crowd. But I do think because he had Paul in jail, he felt like there needed to be some punishment. And the reality was that the commander wasn't aware of what Paul had done, and that's how the world operates. The world 
sometimes just don't know what to do with Christians. And they just kind of uh, launch in on them and attack them. And that's what happened to Paul, because when he got inside the barracks, uh, the commander directed that Paul be flogged and interrogated. Why? To find out why the people were shouting him like this. Now, imagine that. Imagine you standing out and you ain't really you ain't did nothing to nobody. The crowd is hollering and screaming. The police come up, lock you up, take you into custody, take you to jail, and then start, you know, hitting you with a rubber hose uh, until you tell them what you did wrong. You had done nothing wrong. But that was the position that Paul was in as a result of the awful, 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 awful um, lies and, uh, and, 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 uh, and untruths uh, that the people in Jerusalem had said in, in regard to him. The Roman soldiers was not even accustomed to the conversation they were having about a savior named Jesus and about uh, the rituals of the, of the synagogue. Yet they, you know, found it themselves to flog and interrogate Paul to see why he was being shouted at. Think about that. Why do people shout at you? I don't know. I'm going to beat you until I find out. That's what happened to Paul. And so as they stretched him out to flog him, this is what Paul said to the centurion. He said, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't been found guilty. The Roman centurion, that's the captain of the guard, um, heard this testimony, heard Paul's statement. He went to the commander and reported. He said, commander, um, this man said he is a Roman citizen. He says, he asked the question, is, is it is it okay? Is it legal for a Roman citizen to be flogged when he wasn't found guilty? Um, and he told the commander, and the commander said, well, what are you going to do? He asked the commander, what are you going to do? This man is a Roman citizen. This commander went to Paul and said, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Paul said, yes, I am. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. Let me pause here. The commander said, I'm a Roman citizen, but I wasn't born Rome, Roman. I had to pay my way. It's almost like, imagine somebody going to another country and having to get a new passport and new identity in a new country. That was a payment that came with becoming a part of the Roman, um, becoming a Roman. And, and Paul says, well, I, uh, I was born a citizen. And that and quite frankly, put Paul is as they measured um, measured it then in a higher status than this Roman man who had paid for citizenship. Um, when Paul made this declaration, verse twenty nine says that the people who had come to interrogate him, the detectives who came to interrogate him, withdrew. They left the room, and the commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul a Roman soldier in chains. It was not lawful at the time to lock up Roman citizens, especially when they had not been um, convicted of any crime. And so that's what happened. Now, you might wonder why is that story significant? It's significant in that it demonstrates, again, God's the power to bring to pass what he wants. The people wanted Paul dead. God wanted Paul alive. Paul stayed alive. The people wanted to punish Paul. God seen enough and said the punishment is over and God and, and Paul walked away um, um, uh, at that moment unscathed. Uh, the people had a, I had a desire, but God had a purpose. And I just said it with us tonight that in, as, a, as children of God, we must understand that when we are engaged in doing the purpose of God, God has not only our backs, but our fronts and our sides. God has us covered. And so it's important for each of us as Christians to know that when we're doing what God wants us to do, there's literally nothing to worry about because God will open doors. It's the second time that we've seen Paul um, accosted, but it's also the second time that we'll see Paul, um, to put the, the people had in store for Paul, not manifest itself because God had a better plan. This may happen to you on your job with your family. It may happen to you in any number of places. Could even happen to the church, unfortunately. But the reality is, when you're doing the work of God, God will open doors and bring you out. God will protect you. God will direct you. God will keep you. And I want somebody to remember that tonight as we get ready to dis disconnect from this line, that God will do these things for you as you are seeking to do his purpose. Paul just was trying to do God's will. And as a result, um, God was there to deliver him time and time again. And somebody could ask a question, well, the pastor ain't perfect. None of us are perfect. What I'm saying is we are seeking to do God's will. That's why that's important, to truly serve God. We are going to find ourselves in a place where we are experiencing the full protection and the full power of God operating in our lives. I'm going to stop there tonight at verse uh, 29, but I do pray that these words, again, would give us a level of encouragement encouragement. I look forward to seeing many of you all on tomorrow as we prepare for our first Sunday. Some of you all be there tomorrow as we get ready for our first Sunday. So if I don't see you tomorrow, please make sure uh, that I see you on Sunday um, so that we can have a good time. It's going to be a little cooler Sunday. So don't, don't say it's too hot. Just come on to church where we can get together and serve the Lord. I thank God for each of you and I thank God for his word and I pray that his word will be a light unto our paths and a lamp unto our feet.
Let us pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, and we praise you, God. And we thank you, Lord, again for your words. And I pray, God, that even these verses would find themselves encouraging us, Lord, to live for you and to trust you and to serve you. I pray, God, that your word tonight would bless our hearts, that it would get in our hands and feet that we can serve you better. Let your words tonight get in our hearts that we may be strengthened in our inner person. Lord, let your word tonight get on our, our, in our ears that we can hear your word over the winds and the waves of the world. Lord, let your word get on our minds, in our minds. We may have peace that surpasses all understanding and that the fire darts of Satan be quenched. Lord, let your word get uh, on our lips, tongues, vocal, our lungs, and throat that we can declare your word to a dying world, then to each other, and finally to ourselves. God, I pray that you would give us, again, peace, joy, grace, and mercy. I pray, God, again, that you build a head of protection around us, Lord, that the fire and darkness will be quenched. I pray, God, tonight that you give us the ability to, to pray without ceasing, to give you thanks in all things, and then, Lord, to rejoice in you. Please, God, let us never seek or be successful in quenching your spirit. But instead, Lord, let us be led by your spirit, guided by your spirit, protected by your spirit, empowered by your spirit, and, and able to do your work and your will and to serve you better by your Holy Spirit. God, we love you. God, we thank you. And God, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hold on tonight. God bless your phone line. Now unmuted.